John 6, verse 47, verily, verily, true, true. This is so important. Jesus said, I say unto you, whoever is believing on me hath everlasting life. It's in the Greek present, if you didn't read that in the King James. Whoever is believing on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness, and they're dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. Yeah, we're, that was physical food. They're dead physically. We're going to die physically, but he's talking about a spiritual food. You won't ever die spiritually. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, and how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever is eating my flesh and drinking my blood hath eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. We'll even have our physical bodies uh, come back into their glorified state. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood is dwelling in me, and I am dwelling in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even him, shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat man and are dead, but he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is hard. This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, does this offend thee? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before, what if I'm not here physically in the future? He wasn't going to be. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Wow, that's so important because Jesus says you got to understand what I'm saying. Because physically, I'm not going to be here. And so they were thinking physically. They ate physical bread in the wilderness. He's expecting us to eat him like physical bread. He said, that's not what I'm saying. Notice in verse 66, something very tragic. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Instead of staying to understand, they left offended. They thought of cannibalism when he spoke of something very different. I'm not going to be here physically. My body and blood shall be gone as a physical presence. You can't feed on it in the letter. Jesus wasn't talking about a physical eating and drinking. He was talking about a spiritual eating and drinking, an internal receiving of the provision of what he was doing while he was here in the flesh, what he provided when he died on the cross. It's a communion, a common union, a sharing together with him and what he has provided. It is indeed the only way to have life and for that life to go on into eternity. This is so important for you to understand. It is a spiritual union with God by His invisible, indwelling Holy Spirit inside your invisible human spirit. Now, we see your body, but we don't see your spirit. A knowing, personal relationship that saves and secures for all of eternity. Jesus said in John 15, 4, Abide in me, and I in you. Abide in me and I will abide in you. Abide, stay, dwell, commune, have a relationship. I've said before, 
that uh, I got married when I was 18 years old, and sometimes in my life I'd look back and say, man, I missed some times with my college buddies and road trips and all of that. And you know what I say now? I can't think of anyone I'd rather make a road trip with than my wife and the Lord with us because of a vital living relationship that we enjoy. God says, you've got to have a relationship with me. Without that, you can't have a marriage relationship that means anything. In John 15, 7, Jesus gets, got specific. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. When he says abide in me, he got specific. He says, if my words abide in you, 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 under, you understand me, you're getting me, you're hearing from me. That's feeding on him. It is a mutual knowing and abiding. And since he has ascended bodily, he is here now by that invisible spirit that he told his disciples about. If we weren't having communion today, there's a lot of things I'd want to share with you, but I'll wait till another time. In John 16, 13, Jesus referred to it as the spirit of truth. When he has come, Jesus said, he will guide you into all truth. It is a faith process of being guided by the Holy Spirit into truth. Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hebrews eleven six. 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I hope you're hearing that. A rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Most important thing in my life is to know him. That's what that's talking about. As Jesus said in Luke 14, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Man shall not live by physical bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The first step is to believe that he is, he exists, he's real. And that conclusion comes, yes, by an honest observation but also by the word of the truth of this gospel. Jesus lived to author our salvation, died a death that we deserve. And I'm not talking about the physical part of that death. That was his qualifying. That was his qualifying to die for you and me. All the physical part, the beating. Men have gone through those beatings. Men have suffered the horrors of the Holocaust. We could go on and on. He wasn't a substitute for our beatings. He was a substitute for what happened when he cried out to his holy heavenly father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If all we're doing is focused on the physical, that was qualifying him for something very spiritual. Our sins to be laid on that holy one. I deserve what was poured out on him that day. He rose again to live in us, to teach us, for the truth makes us free. It's the blood and the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, the death and the life, the life that he lived that qualified him to die for us. Now it's been broken so that you can participate in it. Broken that you may feed on it. His blood has been given that you might be forgiven. And come into a relationship of feeding upon him. That life that he made possible. You have to be eating it. You have to be consuming it by faith. Look at John 6, 47 where we are. Barely, barely I say unto you, he that is believing on me has everlasting life. Verse 45 says, it is written of the prophets, they shall all be taught of God. Every one of them will be taught of God. And it's not a physical experience. 
Verse 46, not that any man has seen the Father, save he which is of God. He has seen the Father. It's not a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. In verses 47 and 48, Verily I say unto you, He that is believing on me hath everlasting life. Whoever is believing on me, I am that bread of life. And then verse 56, He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood is dwelling in me, and I am dwelling in him. There is nothing external on your part that results in your salvation. The essentials of your eternal salvation are all internal in your heart before God. And anything external simply speaks of what is true internally if it's something that God has instituted. I hope you understand and hear that. The essentials of your eternal salvation are internal and anything external simply speaks of what is true internal. Nothing on the outside ever produces spiritual righteousness. Nothing external can ever make the internal so. Having anything done on the outside never makes it so on the inside. Anything properly done on the outside simply says it's already so. It's already so. What was true in the Old Testament of a Jew is true today of a Christian in the New Covenant. But listen to Romans 2, beginning of verse 28. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter. The spirit, the meaning, the internal reality. You could put Christian there and our Christian ritual of baptism or the Lord's Supper. Let's use baptism. He is not a Christian which is one outwardly, neither is that baptism which is outward in the flesh, But he is a Christian, which is one inwardly, and baptism is that of the heart, in the spirit and not in the letter. Same thing applies, always has, always will. How was Abraham made righteous? By faith, not by circumcision. How am I made righteous? By faith, not by baptism. Jesus said it here in John 6, 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Whether good or bad, it never originates on the inside. It comes from the heart. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. Without the body, every sin, you name it without the body. He goes on to say fornication is a sin against the body. But he said every sin, including fornication, is done without the body. It's internal, always. You're you're not going to hell because of all the things you've done externally. It's what you're not doing internally. And yes, it shows up on the outside. It's diagnostic. That's not where salvation is. Every righteousness is without the body. When people come to me desiring baptism, I have to say, why do you want to be baptized? It's so important for a pastor to ask, why do you want to be baptized? Are they wanting to witness or speak of what has happened in the heart? Or do they think this action has anything with saving them or getting them closer to God, or anything of that nature? Do they simply want to do what God says and testify of a reality that's already present? Because the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. The outward is deadly if it's in any way confused with the inward. 
It's what 2 Corinthians 3, 6 says. God hath made us able ministers of the New Testament or the New Covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. All the symbolic, all the words, if all they are is words and symbols, and we think the words or the symbols will save us, we are lost. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. We all have to understand that. If we think by coming to church or by giving or receiving communion or being baptized or we could go on and on and on that we're right with God, we are wrong. It's an internal reality. Only. Only. And yes, does it make a difference on the outside if you're truly believing the Lord? Don't misunderstand me. It shows up on the outside. The spirit is the reality, the real meaning. The letter speaks of it. And just with a few minutes, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning of verse 23. God's using the Apostle Paul to speak here, but then he's going to quote what Jesus said. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks and break that bread or broke that bread, he said, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament or the, the new covenant in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. When Jesus instituted this supper, he'd not yet gone to the cross. The reality of his sacrifice had not yet been made on Calvary. When he said, This is my body. He was using the letter, the symbol to say, this is representing my body, which is broken for you. Just like he said, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. He was talking spiritually. Do this in remembrance of me. He wasn't saying this is literally my body that he was handing them. He was there in the body. They knew that it wasn't his body except in the letter, in the symbol. <clears throat> Look at verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. In this showing of his death, in this showing of his life that you can participate in now, in this showing, demonstrating symbolically his life and death. <clears throat> For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But instead of that, let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Let him examine himself for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. Why? Because he's not discerning God's body. If we were made right by coming and eating this, then he wouldn't say, let a man examine himself. He says, let a man examine himself on what this physical flesh symbol letter means. And make sure that what it represents and says is true on the inside. So communion is supposed to be a time of self-inspection. Is the reality present? Is the reality present? When someone comes to be baptized, is the reality present? Because those two sacraments represent what it takes to be with God forever in heaven. Receive Christ by faith. Receive the cleansing of sin and have the Holy Spirit come into you. When that happens, show it on the outside. Speak it without ever saying a word through water baptism. 
And then what else is required? <clears throat> Abide in me. Have a relationship with me. Feed on me. Feed on my words. Know me. I know you. What does the Lord's Supper say? Baptism says I've been washed. The Lord's Supper says I'm participating. I'm communing. I'm feeding on his word. I have a living relationship with my Lord today. Let a man examine himself. Because what is he doing if he comes and thinks that taking this physical food, this physical drink, is somehow saving him? He is not discerning God's body. Therefore, he's drinking and eating condemnation upon himself because he's not discerning the Lord's body. He's making the same mistake those disciples did when they said, we can't follow you anymore because this is too hard. He's saying we got to carve off a piece of his flesh and we got to drink his blood. And Jesus was saying, no, I'm telling you something very spiritual. He gave his physical life. He lived that physical life and he came and bore our sins on the cross. By us believing it and trusting in it, we are drinking it. We're eating his body by faith. Anybody thinks they're right with God because they've come here to take communion? They're wrong. They're wrong. Let a man examine himself. Let a man examine himself. Is it real in you? then it's going to show on the outside. But it's not what's showing on the outside that's making it so. It's what's happening on the inside that's making it so. You need to know that. Because we minister the New Testament not in the letter, but in the spirit. I worry about people. I say, I gotta take communion, gotta take communion. Like something spiritual is required. Not going to make heaven if I don't have communion. No, you're not going to have communion if you're not communing with Jesus in your heart. Do you all understand that? I want us to sing before we receive the Lord's Supper.